Hello and welcome back. Today I want to talk to you about probably one of the simplest theorems out of complex analysis, but also one of the most important, and this is the identity theorem. This is something that you can prove with just a little bit of know-how of continuity and power series from Calculus 2. And Honestly, it won't take all that long to get into. So this is something I brought up in the last video where I talked about a strangely deep problem about sequences. So here we're gonna thread the needle and talk about this last thing that maybe you didn't know about. So let's go ahead and get started. The ring bearer is setting out on the quest of Mount Doom. So complex analysis is all about analytic functions or really about power series. And the idea here is that we're going to be exploiting a lot of ideas about power series in order to prove this theorem. And what is the identity theorem? So the identity theorem is all about zeros of analytic functions. And when you take a look at analytic functions, zeros have all sorts of influences throughout the subject. For instance, if you have something that's called an entire function, something that's analytic or can be represented as a power series throughout the entire complex plane, then what you'll end up finding is that the density of your zeros actually has a direct influence on how quickly that function grows. And conversely, if you have a function that grows at, say, a fractional rate, so not an integer order, that function also has to have an infinite number of zeros. And this would be true for something like the mittag leffler function. But in this case, we're talking about a much simpler dependence on zeros, and this comes down to having an accumulation point of zeros inside the domain of the function. So if you have a radius of convergence for your power series, and inside of that radius of convergence, you have a sequence of zeros that converges to a point still inside of that radius of convergence, then that means that that power series has to be identically zero. And this is a really straightforward thing to prove. So let me, let's go ahead and prove this, and then after that, I will tell you why this is called the identity theorem. And so let's go ahead and get to it. So let's go ahead and get started. So complex analysis is all about the study of analytic functions. Analytic functions are really just power series where we let the variable be a complex number. And analytic functions themselves happen to be those functions where the Taylor series for a function coincides with the function itself. So we're gonna end up using this Taylor series representation of an analytic function in order to prove what we wanna prove. So what we're gonna start with is we have some sort of analytic function and say we have some analytic function g. So if a function g is non-zero somewhere inside of the radius of convergence of its power series, then we know that g itself has to be continuous because it's representable by a power series. And so we know that within the neighborhood of that point where it is non-zero, it has to stay away from zero for at least a little bit. If it jumps suddenly to zero, then that would be a discontinuity and that would contradict it being a represented by a power series. So what we're going to do is we're gonna take a look at the disk that represents the radius convergence for our analytic function G. And we're going to assume that there is an accumulation point of zeros somewhere inside of that disk. Now, without loss of generality, we're going to assume that the center of the disk is where that accumulation point is, and we're going to assume that that center is zero. It just makes things easier to write. And if we wanted to run the same argument, all we really have to do is do a Taylor expansion at another point inside of the disk, and the rest of the argument would all hold just the same. What we're going to do is we're going to assume, by way of contradiction, that g is a non-zero function. So it has to be some n for which a n is non-zero. So now we have a sequence of zeros converging to the origin. And what we can say about g then is that g has to be zero at the origin because it's a continuous function. So if we have a zero of an analytic function, then that means that the constant coefficient has to be zero. So a naught, let's say. And that means that we can factor out a z out of that power series. Now, we could have a higher order zero where like maybe the first m entries are all zero. And so what we can do then is we can go ahead and we factor out a z to the m plus one. And what's left is a power series, and we'll call this power series the function h. And h has the property that 
it's going to be non-zero at the origin because otherwise we would have factored out more z's out of that power series so what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at this function h and we know it is non-zero at the origin and like i said before if we have an analytic function that is non-zero somewhere inside of its radius of convergence and h has the same radius of convergence as g then what that means is that h is going to be non-vanishing or non-zero in an immediate neighborhood of that point and this is a problem remember we have an accumulation of points or a sequence of points converging to the origin where g was zero and now we're writing g as z to the m plus one times h of z and if we take a look at that we know that h of z is going to be non-zero in some local neighborhood of our origin and so that means the only contributions inside of that neighborhood of zeros is coming from our z to the m plus one but that is only zero at the origin itself and so that ends up being a contradiction because that means that inside of that neighborhood where h of z is non-zero that we also have that g of z can't be zero there either since this is a contradiction uh we have to look at what the assumption was that we made about g and that we made that assumption about g that it was a non-zero function and there you go. We have just proved that G, if it has an accumulation point of zeros inside of its radius convergence, then G must be identically zero. So that is probably the easiest theorem I've had on my channel up to this point. And it really just takes a little bit of reasoning about power series, which you probably knew from calculus too. The big question I told you I'd tell you is, why is this the identity theorem? Why do we call it that? Well, the answer is really simple. If you have two functions, say function f and a function g, they're both analytic functions, and they have an accumulation point of places where they agree. So you have, say, the sequence zn, and you look at f of zn and g of zn, and that sequence converges inside of their radius convergence, then what you have is that f minus g is another analytic function that vanishes along that sequence. And since it vanishes along a sequence that is converging inside of its radius of convergence, that means that that f minus g function has to be identically zero. And thus, we say that f must be equal to g for all z. And so that's why it's called the identity theorem. And so that's a little bit of complex analysis and over the next, say, several months, I hope to talk a lot more about complex analysis. So if you like the video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you want to hear more about, say, complex analysis or operator theory or numerical analysis or just what it's like to be a mathematician, you know, please subscribe to my channel. And I'll have a lot more videos coming out on all of those topics over the next several months. And so until I see you next time, have a great day.